Hi, I'm James Governor, one of the co-founders of a company called Redmonk. We're an industry research firm focusing on developer-led technology adoption. So that's, I guess, why Docker invited me to DocCon 2020 to talk about some trends that we're seeing in the world of work and software development. So Monk Chips, that's who I am. Um, I spend a lot of time on Twitter. It's a great research tool. It's a great way to find out what's going on and to keep track of, as I say, those people that we value so highly, software developers, engineers, and practitioners. So when I started talking to Docker about this event, it was, uh, yeah, it was pre-Rona, shall we say. Um, the idea of a crowd wasn't a scary thing, but today you see something like this it makes you feel uncomfortable. This is not a place that I want to be. I'm pretty sure it's a place you don't want to be. And, you know, to that end, I think it's interesting, quote by Ellen Powell, she says, work from home is now just work. And we're going to see more and more of that. Organizations aren't feeling the same way they did about work before. Who are these people? Who is my concern? So GitHub says it has 50 million uh, developers, right, on its network. Now, one of the things I think is most interesting is not that it has 50 million developers, perhaps that's a proxy um, for number of developers worldwide, but quite frankly, a lot of those accounts, there's all kinds of people there. There are designers, there are data engineers, there are data scientists, there are product managers, there are tech marketers. It's a big, big community, and it goes way beyond just software developers itself. Frankly, for me, I'd probably be saying there's more like 20, 25 million developers worldwide, but GitHub knows a lot about the world of code. So what else do they know? One of the things they know is that the world of code and software and open source is becoming increasingly global. I get so excited about this stuff. The idea that there are these different software communities around the planet where we're seeing massive expansions in terms of things like open source. Great example is Nigeria. So Nigeria, more than 200 million people, right? The, the, the energy there in terms of events, in terms of learning, in terms of teaching, in terms of the desire to code, the desire to launch businesses, the desire to be part of a global software community is just so exciting. And you know, these, this, this sort of energy is not just in, in Nigeria, it's in other countries in, in Africa, uh, it's happening in Egypt, it's happening around the world. So this energy is something that's super interesting to me. And we need to think about that. We've got global challenges that we need to solve and software is gonna be a big part of that. So, you know, at the moment, we can talk about other countries, but what about, frankly, the gender gap, the gender issue? That, you know, from 1984 onwards, the number of women taking computer science degrees began to not track, but to crater um, in comparison to what men were doing. The tech industry is way too male-focused. There are, there are men that are dominant. It's not welcoming. We haven't found ways to have those pathways and, frankly, to drive inclusion. And the women I know in tech have to deal with a, a, a massively disproportionate amount of, of stress and things like online uh, networks. But talking about online networks and talking about a better way of, of living, I was really excited by GitHub Satellite recently. It was a fantastic um, demo by Alison McMillan. And she did a demo about code spaces. So code spaces is Microsoft's online IDE, new, new platform that they've um, uh, built. And you know, online ADEs, we're never quite sure, you know, plenty of people still out there just using Emacs, but um, Visual Studio Code has been a big success. And, and so this idea of moving to an online IDE, it's been around there for a while. What they did was just make really tight integration. So you're in your GitHub uh, repo and just be able to create a development environment with effectively one click, getting rid of all of the yak shaving, making it super easy. And what I loved was that the demo where Ali's like, yeah, cause this is great. When my kids are having a nap, I could just start coding and I don't have to sort out all the rest of it. And to me, that was amazing. It was like productivity as inclusion. I'm um, here was a senior director at GitHub. They're doing this amazing work and they're making this clear statement about being a parent. And I think that was fantastic because that's what, what to me, part of this working from home, which has been so challenging for so many of us, began to open up new possibilities and frankly, exciting possibilities. So Ali's also um, got a podcast, Parent Driven Development, um, which I, I think is super important because this is about men and women. We're all in this together. Sure, parenting is a team sport, same as software development. And, and, and the idea that we should be thinking about how to be more productive um, is, is super important to me. So I wanna talk a bit about developer culture and how it led to social media. Because you know, social media, we're in this advanced stage now. It's all TikTok, it's like exercise, people doing incredible backflips and stuff like that, doing a bunch of dancing. Um, we've had the world of sharing cat gifts, Facebook. 
you know, we sort of see social media as, I think, a phenomenon in its own right. Whereas for me, I think it's interesting because it's, it's progenitors. Where did it come from? So here's Murray Turoff. So 1971, one of the features in the emergency management information system um, that, that he built, um, which, which it's topical, it was, it was for medical, tracking medical information as well, uh, medical emergencies, um, included a bulletin board system so that it could keep track of what people were doing on a team um, and, and make sure that they were collaborating effectively. Boom, that was the start of something big, obviously. Um, another date I think is worth looking at, 1983, so Radia Pullman, Spanning Tree Protocol. So at DEC, um, they were very good at distributed systems. And the idea was that you could have a distributed system and so much of the internetworking that we do today was based on Radius work. And the notion that basically you could span out a huge network so that everyone could collaborate. That is incredibly exciting in terms of the trends um, that I'm talking about. So then let's look at 1988. You've got IRC. IRC, what developer has not used IRC, right? Well, I guess maybe some of the younger ones might not have. Um, but I, I don't know if we're, we're post IRC yet, but Jarko Okerinen um, at, uh, at a Finnish university, you know, really nailed it with IRC as a platform that people could communicate effectively with. And, you know, then we go into like 1991. So we've had IRC, we've had Finnish universities doing a lot of really interesting work about collaboration. And I don't think it was necessarily an accident that this is where Linus Torvalds announced Linux. So Linux was a wonderfully packaged um, idea in terms of we're going to take this this Unix thing and when I say package what it's what it packaged was the idea that we could we could collaborate on software so um, you know it, it may have just been the work of one person but clearly what made it important made it interesting was finding a, 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 a social networking pattern for software development so that everybody could work on something at scale that was really I think fundamental and foundational now I think it's important if we're going to talk about Linus to talk about some things that are not good about software culture, not good about open source culture, not good about hacker culture. And that's where I'm going to talk about code of conduct. We have not been welcoming to new people. You know, there are, we, we got the acronyms, you know, JFGI, you know, uh, we call people noobs. That's super unhelpful. We've got to find ways to be more welcome, welcoming and more self-sustaining in our communities because otherwise communities will fail. And I'd like to thank everyone that has a code of, code of conduct and has encouraged others to have codes of conduct. We need to have codes of conduct that are enforced to ensure that we have better diversity at our events. And that's for women, underrepresented minorities, um, all different kinds of people need to be well looked after and be in safe and inclusive spaces. And that's for online events, but of course it's also for all of our activities offline. So, Linus, as I say, um, not the most charming of characters at all time, but he has done some amazing technology. So we get to like 2005, the creation of Git. Now Git was, you know, not necessarily um, the distributed version control system that would win, but there were some interesting principles there, and they'd come out of the work that he had done in terms of trying to build and sustain the Linux code base. So it was very much based on experience. He had an itch that he needed to scratch, and there was a community that was building this thing, so what was going to be the option came up with Git, foundational to another huge wave of social change, frankly. Get to Logical Awesome, April, 20, uh, April 2008. GitHub, right? GitHub comes up. They've looked at Git. They've packaged it up. They found a way to make it consumable so that teams can use it and, and really begin to take advantage of the power of that distributed um, version control model. Now, ironically enough, of course, they centralize the service in doing so. So we have a single point of failure on GitHub. But on the other hand, the notion of the pull, pull request, the, the, the primitives that they established and made usable by people, that changed everything in terms of software development. I think a, a, another one that I'd really like to look at is Slack. So Slack is, is a huge success used by all different kinds of businesses. But it began specifically as a pivot from a company called Glitch. It was a game company. And they started, they wanted a tool internally that was better than IRC. So they built out something that later became Slack. So Slack 2014 um, is, is, is established as a company. And basically it was this Slack fit software engineering, uh, the focus on automation, um, the conversational aspects, the asynchronous aspects. It really pulled things together in a way that was interesting to software developers. And I think we've seen this pattern in the world, frankly, over the last few years. Software developers are influencers. So Slack, first used by the engineering teams, later used by everybody. 
And arguably, you could all you could say the same thing actually happened with Apple. Um, Apple was 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 mainstreamed by developers adopting that that platform. Get to 2013, boom again. Solomon hikes Docker, right? So Docker wasn't was I mean containers were not new. They were just super hard to use. People found it difficult technology. It was esoteric. It wasn't something that they could fully understand. Solomon did an incredible job of understanding how it could fit containers could fit into modern developer workflows. So if we think about immutable um, images, if we think about the ability to have everything required in the package where you are, it really tied into what people were trying to do with CI CD, tied into microservices, and certainly the notion of sort of disposability. Docker nailed that. And I guess from this conference at least, the rest is history. So I want to talk a little bit about, you know, scratching the itch, in particular what has become, I, I call it the developer aesthetic. So let's go into dark mode now. You know, I've talked about developers laying out these foundations and frameworks that, that you know, that get mainstreamed. Frankly, now my son, who's 14, he laughs at me if I don't have dark mode on in an application. And it's this notion that developers, you know, they, they, they have an aesthetic, um, it does get adopted. I mean, it's quite often jokey. Um, one of the things we've seen in the really successful platforms like GitHub, Docker, NPM, uh, let's look at GitHub, let's look at Docker, that playfulness, I think was really interesting. And that changes the world of work, right? So we've got the world of work, which can be buttoned up, which can be somewhat tight. I think both of those companies were really influential in thinking that software development, which is a profession, it's also something that can and is fun. And, and think about how can, we, how can we make it more fun? How can, we, how can we develop better applications together? Takes me to, if we think about Docker, talking about build, share, and run, for me, the key word is share, because development has to be a team sport. It needs to be sharing, it needs to be kind, and it needs to bring together people to do more effective work, because that's what it's all about, doing effective work. If we think about Zoom, it's a proxy for collaboration in terms of its value. So, you know, we've, we've got all of these airlines, and frankly, add up their, their share, the, add, add up their, their total value, it's currently less than Zoom. So video conferencing has become so much of how we live now on a consumer basis, but certainly from a business to business perspective. And when I talk about how we live now, I wanna think about like, what will come out of this traumatic, and it is incredibly traumatic time, um, you know, for so many, I'd like to say I'm, I'm very privileged, I can work from home. So thank you to all the frontline workers that are out there, they're, they're not in that position. Um, but overall, what I'm really thinking about, are there some things that will come out of this that will benefit us as a culture? Looking at cities like Paris, uh, Milan, London, New York, putting in new cycling um, infrastructure so that people can social distance and travel outside because they don't feel comfortable on, on, on public transport. I think it's sort of amazing. Widening pavements, oh, we can't do that. All these cities have done it literally overnight. And this sort of change is, is exciting. And, and what does come after? Like, are there some positive aspects of the current uh, issues that we face? So I, I've got a conference or I've got a community that, that, that me and, and, and some others um, ha, have been working on. Uh, so Katie from HashiCorp and Carla from Container Solutions, basically about, look, what will the world look like in, in, in developer relations? Can we have developer relations without the air miles? Because developer advocates, they do too much travel. It ends up, you know, burning them out. Developer relations, people don't like to say no. They may have bosses that say, you know, it's like, oh, that conference went great. Now we're going to roll it out worldwide to 47 cities. That stuff is terrible. It's terrible from a, a, a personal perspective. And it's really terrible from an environmental perspective. We need to travel less. Virtual events are crushing it. Microsoft just had build, right? Normally there'd be sort of, you know, just over 10,000 people. They had 245,000 plus registrations. 40,000 of them were in the last day, right? Red Hat Summit, 80,000 people. IBM Think, 90,000 people. GitHub crushed it as well. Like this is a more inclusive way. People can dip in, they can be from all around the world. You know, I mentioned Nigeria and how fantastic it is. Very often Nigerian developers and, and, and advocates find it hard to get visas. Why should they be shut out of events? Events are going to start to become remote first because frankly, look at it. If you're turning in those kinds of numbers and, and, and you know, Microsoft was already doing great online events, but they absolutely nailed it. They're going to have to ask some serious questions about why everybody should get back on a plane again. So if you're going to do remote, you've got to be intentional about it. It's one thing I find so exciting about Git, GitLab. GitLab's culture is amazing. 
Everything is documented. Everything is public. Everything is transparent. Make that really clear. And if you look at their principles, everything, you can't have implicit collaboration models. Everything needs to be documented and explicit so that anyone can work anywhere and they can still be part of the team. Remote first is where we're at now. Coinbase, Shopify, even Barclays says they're not going to go back to having everybody in offices in the way they used to. This is a fundamental shift. And I think it's got significant, significant implications, you know, for all industries, but definitely for software development. Here's the thing. The last 20 years were about distributed computing, microservices, the cloud. We've got pretty good at that. The next 20 years will be about distributed work. We can't have everybody living in San Francisco and London and Berlin. The talent is distributed. The talent is elsewhere. So how are we going to build tools? Who is going to scratch that itch to build tools to make them more effective? Who's building the next generation of apps? You are. Thanks.